I want to continue last week. We started talking about how to see others. And last week's message was entitled, The Power of Seeing Others. Today, I've entitled this, You Do Not Have a Sin Nature. You do not have a sin nature. So the theme of this lesson is rediscovering our true nature, the image of God in humanity. Now I'm going to be quoting several times from a father, a priest, and a pastor whose name is Kenneth Tanner. He's pastor of Holy Redeemer, author of The Venerable God in Michigan. And today's message is, is actually the basis, the foundation for everything I said last week in part one. This one could have come first, but I think it's appropriate that it's coming today. Here's two thoughts from last week. Jeff's going to put them up for you. Each person, we said this last week, each person is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to get to the bottom of. Boy, if that doesn't change your view of, you know, people that you meet, maybe even people that are already in your life that are difficult to love. Look at this. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 was a text that we used last week. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, how we view others, how we treat others, has everything to do with how we view this topic regarding human nature and God's love. So this morning, right off, I want to challenge a flawed perspective on humanity, God, and the nature of a fallen world. This term, the fall, it's a standard evangelical perspective of man, of humanity. It goes like this, first of all, that the creation was literal. Adam and Eve in the garden, creation, all of that was literal. Number two, there came a command from God not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Third, there was a temptation and then an act of disobedience by Adam and Eve. And that act of disobedience is generally referred to as the fall. Now, I want you to notice something that the term, the fall, is actually never used anywhere in the Bible. Not once. It's a construct of evangelicalism, creating a narrative of Genesis chapter 3. But whose narrative? What narrative are we believing? And by the way, evangelicalism is a fairly new movement and the majority of it is had and expressed here in America, in the West. So then we have the fall, as it's termed. And there's several components to the fall. Let me give you just 40,000 foot view. Here, there's five. Number one, spiritual death. Evangelicals believe that Adam and Eve's disobedience resulted in immediate spiritual death, which means separation from God. Hold on to that because that's paramount. That's built in to what we believe when you're an evangelical. Their perfect relationship with God was broken. Number two, physical death. Death entered the world as a result of sin, meaning that humanity became subject to mortality. Number three, the sin nature. Evangelicals believe that Adam and Eve's sin resulted in a corrupted human nature that is passed down to all of their descendants, referred to as the doctrine of original sin. This means that all humans are born with a sinful nature. That's this teaching. And they have an inclina inclination towards sin. And then we have the curse. This is where God pronounces a curse as a result of the fall upon women and their childbirth, 
giving child, uh, go, experiencing childbirth, giving birth to, to children, toil in labor for men, and then Satan himself, that there be enmity between humanity and him. All of that construct and the word fall is never used in the Bible. So who put that together? And why do we just massively, especially in the West, primarily in the West, as evangelicals, just accept that and believe that? And of course, the fifth one is the need for personal salvation. What do I mean? Being born again, only made available through the blood of the sacrifice of God's Son, Jesus. Unless one personally accepts Jesus into their heart and adheres to a changed lifestyle, commiserate with the views of biblical authority, inerrancy, and holiness, such salvation is at best suspect and at worst damnable. In other words, eternal conscious torment is where you will go if you don't believe properly and accept Jesus into your heart. All right, now, why did I share that with you? That's not, that's not the teaching of my lesson, I needed to give you that as a background because what I want to do now in the next several minutes is challenge that entire view of God, human nature, and the thing called the fall. So we are going to, redis re we are going to rediscover our true nature, the image of God in humanity. We are made in the image of God, not defined by sin. You don't have a sin nature, rather you possess a human nature that's affected by sin, a condition that battles against the goodness of our divine image. Here, look, look at this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. You see, our identity is rooted in the divine image, the imago Dei as it's called. An inherent goodness bestowed upon us by our Creator. Sin does not define us. Rather, it distorts the image that's already there. Now, what's the definition of sin? Sin is anything that stands against the eternal love of God, and the love that God embodies for us. And although sin is foreign and destructive, it pervades humanity like a cancer. So it's a disease. It's not a failure, it's not a fall, it's a disease. And when somebody has a disease, do you shout at them? Do you embarrass them? Do you get angry with them? Do you curse them? Do you demand that they change and stop that disease? Or do you take them to the hospital where there's love and redemption and healing for a cancer that came upon the entire race of humanity. See, God's declaration of creation is that it was very good, and that includes humanity. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. You see, your involvement in evil does not define who you are. It is a tragic rejection of the inerrant goodness with which you were created. A profound work of love, a profound work of the love of God, the divine potter. Get this. God so wanted to fellowship, so wanted to have a relationship with human beings that he fashioned them like a potter would the clay. And he creates them. And he instills in every human being his love. You are fashioned by love, for love, and you by nature are love. You have the very spark, the very DNA of God as a human being. And not some human beings, not just people that go to church, sing in the choir, believe correctly, believe and read the scriptures correctly, all of that mess, Western evangelicalism largely. No, this divine potter 
put all of humanity together, gave all of them a divine nature, and sin as a cancer entered in to blind us to that goodness and try to destroy what God created as our divine potter. Every human being shares in this original goodness, bearing the divine image within. This is the essence of the declaration that, quote, God saw all that he made and it was very good. You see, sin is nothing more than a war against our good creation. That's what sin is. You're not a sinner. You're God's creation. You do not have a sinful nature. You have a loving nature. You have God's nature. You have the divine spark, his DNA. But there's a war warring against your good nature, your divine nature. We could look at it this way. Sin is an alien force, not a defining characteristic. Would you read that aloud with me? Everybody together, ready? Read. Sin is an alien force, not a defining characteristic of humanity. Now, Paul elaborates on this so beautifully in the book of Romans in chapter 7. I'll begin reading in verse 15. This is how the sellout to sin affects my life. I found myself, I find myself doing things my conscience does not allow. My dilemma is that even though I sincerely desire to do what which to do that which is good, I don't and the thing and the things I despise I do. It is obvious that my conscience sides with the law, which confirms then that it is really not I who does these things, but sin manifesting its symptoms in me. It has taken my body hostage. The total extent and ugliness of sin that inhabits me reduced my life to good intentions that could not be followed through. Willpower has failed me. This is how embarrassing it is. The most diligent decision that I make to do good disappoints. The very evil I try to avoid is what I do. Now I've outlined this verse. Look at it. If I do the things I do not want to do, then it is clear that I am not evil, but that I host sin in my body against my will. It has become a predictable principle. I desire to do well, but my mere desire cannot escape the evil presence that dictates my actions. The real person that I am on the inside delights in the law of God. There is another law, foreign to my design, the law of sin, activating and enrolling the members of my body as weapons of war against the law of my mind. I am held captive like a prisoner of war in my own body. It doesn't matter how I weigh myself. By my own efforts, I just do not measure up to the expectations. The situation is absolutely desperate for mankind. Is there anyone who can deliver them from the death trap? Watch this. Is there anybody that can deliver us out of this mess? Thank God. This is exactly what Jesus has done, or what God has done through Jesus Christ, our leader. He has come to our rescue. Underscore, highlight, put it in red. Jesus Christ came to rescue us, not to condemn us, not to provide a bloody sacrifice for an angry God and his retributive justice. Paul writes, I am finally free from this conflict between the law of my mind and the law of sin in my body. Paul's struggle illustrates that sin is an external force warring against the true nature within us which delights in God's law and goodness. Wow. Wow. What a mouthful. What a teaching. What a passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 7. Sin distorts and conceals our true nature. We are created in the image of love, not hatred. I'm created in the image of humility, not pride. I'm created in the, in the image of generosity, not greed. And Jesus' sinlessness 
and its implications for our understanding of humanity changes everything. And how you view this about God's nature and the fact that you do not have a sin nature will change completely how you view others that you're around. Jesus, fully human and fully God, shows us that sin is not inherent to human nature. His sinlessness is the measure of true humanity. Let's put this on the screen here. Human nature is not inherently evil. Instead, it shares in an original created goodness that has been wounded by sin. It's a disease. We need a hospital. This fundamental belief is rooted in the teachings of early Christians and our Judaic heritage. Do not be misled. Sin is not an intrinsic part of the human nature. And see, this transforms then how we see everyone. We view every person through the lens of Jesus Christ. Now Paul hints at this. Redemption. What's our redemption? Who's going to save us? Because all of us find us in the words of Paul. All of us find ourselves in the words of Paul in Romans 7. Men, the things that I would, I know they're right, I don't do. And the things that I know are wrong, I do those. What a contest. And he says, there's a way out. And it's Christ's victory over sin, not mine. Christ's victory over sin. See, it's Christ's obedience that surpasses Adam's transgression. Again from Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Well, who's the many that were disobedient and made sinners. Humanity. The, all of us. Good, thank you. Yes, all of us. Well, so who's the many that because of the one man's obedience will be made righteous? Just people that go to church? Just people that believe the way I do? While Adam's sin brought destruction, Christ's obedience brings restoration, highlighting that sin is not our end. Redemption and righteousness are. I'm going to quote Brother Tanner. Quote, the sinlessness of Jesus Christ is greater than the collective sin of humanity, and his life story of perfect love is the measure of every human. Oh. You mean when I look at other humans, even ones I don't like, that are difficult to get along with, I'm supposed to see them not only with perfect love, but as perfect love? The expression of perfect love? Do you know how hard that is, God? Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, he's crazy in love. This good creation in us remains, and it's going to be fully restored. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any one is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Look at the word if. Leave that up, Jeff, if you would. Therefore, if any one is in Christ... Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Read it aloud. Ready? Read. The new is here. I've always read the word if as a condition. If you accept Jesus, if you read your Bible, if you go to the right church, if you believe the way we do, if you live a moral life afterwards, if, if you accept Jesus, if Jesus is in your life,
Because if he is, well, then that applies. You're a new creation. But what if he isn't? Well, then you're not. You're not born again. You're going to a place called eternal, uh, called hell, called eternal conscious torment. What if instead of a condition, the word if is a conclusion? I'm not playing word games with you now. If you will read verse 19, 17 in context and read the previous two or three verses, he's talking here about that transfer, transfer or that transaction that takes place between the one disobedient and the one who was obedient and that it's on behalf of all humanity. And then he says, therefore, therefore, as a conclusion, if anyone is in Christ, not a condition, it's a conclusion. Since he did this for all the many, then this is true. Every man is a new creation because we are in Christ. In Christ we're made new. And the original goodness of our creation is not restored but renewed. It's, it's, we didn't lose it. it. It's renewed to us. The blinders are removed. We mature. We grow in a, an awareness, if you will, of who we are. Although Adam's sin has far-reaching and destructive consequences for all humanity. Christians trust that the obedient life of the God-man far surpasses Adam's transgression. I'm going to quote Kenneth again, Brother Tanner. Quote, God cannot become what is inherently evil. When God becomes human, he takes on human nature as he finds it, subject to the conditions of the fall. What has not been assumed has not been redeemed. But a good creation remains in every human, no matter how many years of soot mar its incandescent reality. End quote. Wow. Jesus didn't become sin, full. He didn't become sinful in nature. He became a human, subject to sin's forces. And then you know what he did? He died. He defeated through death the power of death. He defeated through death and the cross all that sin had brought. He brought a divine hospital called the cross and redeemed all of humanity. Put them all through the hospital and we've come out the other side healed of the disease of sin. Not from something I do or strive to do or try to have to keep trying to be good enough. He did it once for all and he uttered the words, it is finished and he rose again from the dead. So our conclusion is this. We see ourselves and others through the lens of Christ. What's our key takeaway? Jesus is the lens through which we should view every human being including ourselves, sin does not define us. God's image does. So we'll close with this passage. This is from the Phillips translation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. This means that our knowledge of men can no longer be based on their outward lives. Indeed, even though we knew Christ as a man, we do not know him like that any longer. For if a man is in Christ, that's not, a, that's not a condition, that's a conclusion. For if a man is in Christ, he becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. All, all this is God's doing. For he has reconciled us to himself through Christ. Say it out loud. This is God's doing. Say it. Say it with me. This is God's doing. Yes. I can't do it. I'm not designed to do it. Okay, one more Kenneth Tanner. I love this guy. Quote, sin is a power that afflicts us. No doubt about it. But it is important to recall that we are not our sins. 
They are not our identity. They do not define the human person or any human. The human God does. And that is good news. You see why I wanted to do communion again? We're going to celebrate his body, his blood. He did it. It's finished. I stop striving. And like we learned a couple of weeks ago, when is a problem not a problem? First one to raise their hand. I'll pay for your I'll pay for your Brandon Lake ticket. When is a problem if you give me the right answer? When is a problem not a problem? We have a hand raised over here. When we stop struggling. I just paid for your Brandon Lake ticket. All right, here we go. 